Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today on our uh, day in the life of uh, Lag Distillery. Uh, I hope you're all having a lovely Sunday. You're having a beautiful weekend. Um, as uh, some of you, and I hope most of you know, this should have been a very important uh, weekend for us as Alvaro and Distillers, as it should have been our uh, 25th anniversary Iron Malted Music Festival. So I reckon that by this time it would have all been uh, a lag distillery, having a survivor's lunch, as uh, yesterday should have been a heavy day for all of us, celebrating and having a good time. Uh, but unfortunately, as you can imagine, uh, we are um, not celebrating as we wanted to, but we are here at home, but nonetheless, we're still celebrating, we're still raising a drum, and today we'll get to talk about all things lag, which is actually uh, a good opportunity for us to show you uh, what we're doing company-wise and our distillery is doing down south as well. Uh, we just uh, celebrated our first uh, birthday, so brand, brand new. Uh, but we do have a few things for you today to uh, get you as excited as we are as well about this uh, brand new assistant distillery of ours. Uh, first of all, I will actually show you a beautiful, amazing uh, virtual tour that the team actually done a lag put together uh, just for today, which is awesome. And then uh, we'll have a, a little interview, a uh, question and answer, a Q&A with the distillery manager, Graham Oman. So if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, this is your time to ask all of the geeky details and, you know, peated whiskey questions that you always had uh, put aside for this moment. So without further ado, I'm just going to uh, play the video for you guys. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I do apologize, as always, if there are any technical issues or if you're uh, having difficulties at hearing me or seeing me, I'm sorry, but I hope you can see the video well. Uh, if you can't, there's no problem, don't worry, because we will post it on our social uh, pages later anyway, so you'll be able to go and see it in much better quality. Uh, so here we go, I'm just going to play it for you now. Here we are outside the visitor centre and the Blitton Hill House. We are situated 18 miles southwest of the main ferry terminal Brodick, and if you're travelling from Lochranza, we are 49 miles south. We have views of Ilse Craig in the Firth of Clyde, and on a really good day, you can see right across to Northern Ireland. Historically, the south end of the island had the biggest culture of making whiskey here on Ireland. Whiskey smuggling and illicit distilling was a big part of our life for locals. However, after many run-ins with customs and excise, they decided to bring in military men to sort out the problem. And so the last legal distillery on the Isle of Arran was called Lag. And now we need to make sure that our water is good. And thankfully, yes, it was. It's pure, it's natural, and it comes into our site underground. And the water is pumped into the distillery where it's filtered and it's ready to use for all our wonderful whiskey making process. Cheers! I'm standing in one of the two barley fields located behind Lag Distillery. Isle of Arran Distillers is dedicated to creating a quality product and we don't compromise on our ingredients. All of the barley used here at Lag is coming from the northeast of Scotland. It's been malted for us at Fruit Malts in Montrose to our specific requirements of approximately 50 female parts per mill. The peat that's being used in the kiln is coming from near St Fergus in Aberdeenshire, making it a highland peat and giving it floral notes such as heather and malt. Although traditionally the west coast of Scotland isn't known for its barley production for the whisky industry, the two fields here at Lag are allocated for Isle of Arran distillage. For at least a couple of weeks of the year, 100% Arran barley will be flowing through our stills. We can't wait to taste the whiskey when it's matured. Hello there, and welcome to the start of the tour here at Black Distillery. Join me here at the, the Wall of Fame, where all our cask owners are celebrated as part of our family here, helping to establish the legacy that Black Distillery will become on the Isle of Arran. Uh, there are many advantages to being part of the cask society. The greatest one of all, which is one of the very first bottles from our first fill cask, which is currently residing in our warehouse. We do hope that you come to join us here at the Lag Distillery very soon, and I look forward to raising a glass with you then. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or wherever you might be. My name is going to take you through the process um, involving the mash tun. 
um, the start of really the process inside the uh, inside the production room here at LAG. So I'll take you through what you can see before we talk you through the process itself. Um, so just behind Graham there, who's filming me, uh, we've got our free hot water tanks. So you can see the mash done here, uh, the main part of the process. Up above, towards the ceiling there, uh, we've got our grist hopper, so we store four tons of grist in that. Uh, down below, as we're on the, uh, the first floor here, on the ground floor, we have our, our mill where we mill the barley. Uh, and through the walls there, you can't see it, but we have two 20 ton silos, and that's where we store our barley. The barley is fed through on a conveyor system and goes into our mill, as I said, just on the floor there. It's then fed up into the hopper, and that gives us four tons of grist. Um, and we always mill four tons a day. Uh, and we do that five days a week, so about 20 tons a week that we're, uh, that we're milling. Our grist on a morning comes down through the hopper and at a pipe at the back of the mash tun, just out of sight here, um, that's where we mix it with the first water that goes in, 17,000 litres of water, four tons of grist, uh, and that um, is about 67 degrees, uh, and we cool it down slightly um, to achieve an overall temperature between 63 and a half and 64 and a half half degrees centigrade inside the mash tun. That's an ideal temperature uh, for extracting the maximum amount of sugar. For our mash, so our four tons of grist and 17,000 litres of hot water, will sit in there for about an hour, um, gently seeping away and we're extracting sugar uh, and water at that point. And incidentally, that's what uh, uh, we're extracting here. That's the cloudy water that helps us with our flavour profile and sugar extraction. So we extract the cloudy wort here at LAG. Um, as I say, that will sit there for about an hour um, before we open the underback, which is again just behind this shot here. Uh, and then we can begin our transfer process. Okay, so once we've uh, started the transfer, um, after about 13 pounds, it's time for our second water, uh, which is about 6,000 litres. It can be more or less, depending on how much we put in uh, for the first water. Uh, and we'll heat that up to 78 degrees centigrade. Uh, so we go up the way with the temperature, uh, and that rinses through the bed of grist there, the bed of grain, and we extract more sugars, and also rinse more of the sugar out that we've got. I'll say we send that across to the wash back there. So we've one more water to put in, water, and this time we go up again in temperature, we take it right up to 97 degrees, uh, and we put about 14,000 litres on this time. Now, the second and third waters are both sparged on, so that's just a shower system that sprinkles the water onto the grain. And this just washes the rest of the sugars through, uh, which we then transfer via the underback into the wash back. So the third water that we put on, let's say 14,000 litres, we don't transfer that across to the wash, wash back. We only transfer 20,000 litres across. So the third water... Uh, in essence, what we're doing is rinsing the last small amount of sugar from the grain. And what we do, we don't waste that. It's too weak to go on uh, further down the production line, but we don't waste it. We pump that back into number one, and that then becomes our first water for the following day's production cycle. So we retain as much sugar as we possibly can. These are our wash backs. Washbacks are giant buckets, basically. They're used to ferment, wort, and produce alcohol. We've got four of them, and they're made of Oregon pine from Vancouver Island. And the reason we use traditional wooden-style washbacks is that they help regulate the temperature of the liquid inside. And they also, the flora that lives inside a wooden washback helps impart a little bit of extra flavor to the final product we make. They all hold 25,000 litres of liquid, but we only fill them to 20,000 litres because this is where the yeast is added and we need to leave a bit of extra space at the top for the yeast to do its business. So in this wash back, we've got this morning's fresh patch of wort taken from the sun and we have added the yeast. And what the yeast is doing, well, it's a fungus and it basically converts sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide. And this is called fermentation. The contents of this wash back have been fermenting for one day. And you can see the agitation. You won't be able to smell, but I can. 
the massive aromas coming off, the carbon dioxide, and the hundreds of other chemicals the yeast is producing in alcohol. We call these congeners in the industry, and they're what gives whiskey its unique flavours and character. In this washback, we have the finished product of this stage. It's called Wash. It's a strong beer that doesn't taste very much like beer. It's 8% alcohol. Uh, and the cloudy style of water we produce here, interacting with our yeast, will create a lot of rich, heavy, earthy congeners. It's designed to accentuate the peatiness of the whiskey we produce. Here at Lag, we have two stills. One more still, 10,000 litres, and one which has got 7,500 litres in it. These still run for approximately seven hours per shift. We have a bulbous uh, wash still, and we have a, a lamp glass spirit still. The bulbous wash still basically designed to allow the heavy vapours to get across the line and put them down into the, the state where we're trying to collect most of these heavy vapours for our spirit. Whereas if you look at the, the spirit still, the spirit was more lamp glass shape. And what we're trying to achieve in here is to get all these heavy vapours across as quick as possible with the reflux that most people use in the industry. Within here, we're running the spirit approximately 10 to 11 litres per minute. Unlike our sister distillery up in Alcanza, they run about six to seven litres a minute, which gives them a more eastery flavour, which is a lighter spirit than what we have. Down the flag here, we're looking for a more heavy peaking spirit, which is more on the dark side. The design is the most important factor when looking for the spirit characteristics. Reflux is where the alcohol turns to vapour and recondenses inside the still. This usually happens when the volatile vapours contact the cold copper further up the neck. If we were to run this still 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we would be producing approximately 1 million litres of alcohol. Hello, here we are in Black, Black's first warehouse, warehouse number one where we have all of our filling equipment. We fill many different casks in here. We fill about 63 each week on average. We also fill cherry hogsheads, cherry butts, wine casks, rum casks, and anything else we can fill. We also have the only racking system I like here, which is where all of the light cast society barrels are kept for all of you that are Bought one. That also ties in. We have one of the most valuable casks here, which is cask number one, which is stored way up at the back, which is for the Light Cast Society members again. In 10 years, it will come out as a whiskey in which you will all get your own bottle if you are part of the society. We then also have our warehouse two and three which are designated for bulk spirit, which is the spirit that becomes the whiskies we love. We also have three new warehouses in plan for lag because we have so much whiskey, we need more space to hold it. On top of that development, we have 3,000 apple trees, which will hopefully one day, or will one day, give us apples in order to make lag cider, which will eventually be turned into brandy, which will hopefully be very nice. Cool, amazing. That was very, very detailed. I absolutely love that video. Thank you to all of our team uh, alike for making that. So uh, without further ado, I'm just gonna let on stage our LAG distillery manager, Graham Omond. So here we go. Hi, Hi Graham, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, how are you? Very good, very good. Having a nice, uh, lovely Sunday and uh, getting ready for a few whiskeys to, to drink with you as well later, which is nice. <laughs> 
try and make it as close to the Lag lunch celebration as we could have had today. Yeah, we should have sent a little uh, lunch uh, pa a package to all of the people that <laughs> that wanted to get part in it. That would have been. Uh, we do. Uh, that's a good thing to remind people that we actually have uh, amazing food uh, down at La at our cafe and this is our center. So uh, please make sure that you stop by for like you know a scone or like a, a nice super nice sandwich. which is very delicious as well. Yeah, we're all thoroughly spoiled down here with the food. That's for sure. <laughs> Exactly. Cool. Well, this is a nice opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. I remember I met you. Um, met you were still a little bit connected to the crunch, and then lag was open. So uh, I saw the change, you know, with my with my own eyes. Uh, but uh, let me ask you first, like you know, a basic question. So, where are you from, Greg? Oh, um, originally, well, I was originally from Tairi. I lived there for four years and then uh, my family moved to Isla when I was four and I stayed there until I was 18 and moved on to university and I've lived in Arran since 2011. So it's a long time now, <laughs> come to think of it. <laughs> so did you, uh, did you move um, because of your, like the role of the job or did you move just because you wanted to live in Arran? Uh, no, I, uh, I, I was at university in uh, Air. I uh, studied there for four years, and when I finished my when I finished my degree, I moved back to Isla, and I worked in Isla for a short while. And I was then offered the job uh, at Aaron. I was asked if I would be willing to to work at long shift hours, uh, very unsociable shift hours. I said yes, absolutely. I will take that, no problem. <laughs> So how was that relationship with whiskey when you were growing up then? My, my relationship with whiskey? Well, my my mother actually ran a bed and breakfast on the islands and I think that was my first connection to the industry itself. Uh, it may be hard to believe for a lot of people, but growing up, if you grow up in Isla and it's all you know, you don't really notice how big the whiskey industry is. I mean, you, you, Isla is just this island that you're, you feel like you're trapped on as a, as a kid. You don't really think of it as a, as a whiskey paradise. But um, I saw that through the eyes of all the uh, foreign tourists that were coming and staying with my mother. Uh, she ran the B&B straight out of her house, so I had a lot of contact with all these people. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. They were very, very nice people. And I, I got to see the passion as I grew up and how important the island was that I grew up on, how important it was to other people and other cultures. And it was, it was quite an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Uh, it is, it is, we always say, especially uh, you know, especially now when we talk about our distilleries as well, it's always nice to realize how big you know uh, the iron world goes around. That there are so many people visiting from so many different places, and um, not just you know for our distilleries, but also just because Iron is such a wonderful island, as you said. So it's uh, it's a lovely experience. I, I think it must be awesome to be able to live there now. So um, a little bit of uh, more of your background then. So you already told us you were studying. So what was your background before you joined uh, the whiskey world? Well, I got an honours degree in biotechnology from the Scottish Agricultural College in Ayr. That was a degree done through Glasgow University. Um, I always wanted to work in the industry, but I, I never actually thought I'd be working in the production side. I originally thought, well, I'll go and do a food science style degree um, become an analytical scientist and maybe go from there. Um, unfortunately, though, when I graduated in the height, of, when was it? <laughs> 2010 or 2011, right about there, the height of the recession uh, at the time. I know every, every few years there's a recession, but that just, that was my one. And um, there was no science jobs going at the time. And so I was uh, back in Isla, uh, went straight back to the co op, which I worked there when I was in high school, straight back there after my degree. And then after six months, uh, James McTaggart, who I know for Isla, got in touch with me and said, you've got a degree, you're passionate, you like, you like whiskey. Uh, if you're willing to move to Aaron, there's a job for you if you like. And that yeah, was the best decision I ever made in my life was uh, moving out here. <laughs> That's amazing. That's very similar actually to Ryan's uh, experience as well, our warehouse manager, because he also, you know, knocked on the door and said, hey, do you have any vacancies? Last thing he knew, you know, the week after he was already working there. So uh, a very nice way to deal, you know, with uh, with jobs and vacancies in our distillery is pretty cool. 
So actually, before we move on, uh, we already have a question actually from Derek. Hi, Derek. I hope uh, you're doing well. Thank you for joining us today as well. Um, we do miss you all, Ysags and non at our festival. So uh, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your support. But he actually has a question for you already. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to fire away. So he's asking, um, he's just saying, hi, Graham, nice to see you. Hope you and the family are all well. How are things going with the Apple Orchard that lag? Are there any plans to release an Apple brandy or pitted lag Apple cider this year or maybe next year? Hi, Derek. Uh, it's good to hear from you. I'm, I'm, I wish you were here as always because I'm so used to seeing your face every year and having a nice chat with you. But um, I'm sure we'll catch up another time. But to answer your question, no, unfortunately, the Apple Orchard is still in its infancy. We are, I mean, there are apples that are still being produced, but they're you're talking the crabbiest, the crabbiest of apples, even though they are cider apples. Very, very small. You're looking maybe for another another three years before we think we'll have enough product to maybe launch something. Uh, right now, the apples have been tended to very regularly. In fact, one of our uh, stillmen who you saw in the video, young Max Robson, he's uh, been taken off his uh, apprentice stilling right now and is actually helping Davey uh, look after the, the apple trees and helping shape them for us so they can be ready for the next few years. We're all, we're all excited about that. Every time we talk about that, everyone needs to know what they're doing, <laughs> which is very cool. Nice. So uh, you already mentioned the fact that James was the one that gave you this opportunity to the join Alavira and Distillers. So did you enjoy working with him? Did you learn a lot from him? Did you Do you think that you shared the same values that he passed on to you? Yeah, absolutely. James has um, absolute passion for whiskey and, and knows what makes a good dram. And that was something I really wanted to learn from him and worked under him for direct, worked under James directly for between seven and eight years. And there's a lot I learned in the industry that I've been able to take down here. And there's a number of, it's, just, it's not just tips and tricks, it's just experience, knowing what to look for. And there's a, I think the most important thing that and that James always stated over and over again is it's the it's the Goodwood policy. Absolutely, no matter what you do, there are you have to make sure that your barrels are top notch. Otherwise, what's the point of creating this expensive liquid if it's not going to be looked after while it's maturing? It's just an absolute waste of money and time. Very so true. <laughs> very very true. Well, I'm glad that they showed, you know, throughout the whole company as well, and we're treating uh, uh, spirits, you know, with the same quality emphasis and quality focus that we have in Locranza as well. So uh, I think it must have been very exciting for you because obviously you, um, you know, you saw everything happen. So I have a lot of questions about how how do you actually, you know, build. A new distillery, like how how do you how do you choose everything? It's just fascinating to me the idea that you just sit down with someone and decide it step you know uh, step by step you know every single little thing. So uh, tell us a little bit, like how did you choose your barley? How did you choose your you know washbacks and everything all together? Well, it wasn't just uh, myself or James. It was actually a team effort between many many people at Adam Stillers. Uh, managing directors, accountants, the whole lot of us, we all had our true sense thrown in and we um, talked at great length with Forsyth's, the company that uh, supplied us with everything about what was possible, what they would advise and we bounced plenty of ideas back. I, I still remember, um, <laughs> this is a, a memory from just a few years ago, when we, after we made the decision to build the distillery, uh, we picked the grounds, everything was uh, getting planned, you know, the, the foundations of the actual building were, were, already, start were already starting. But the, uh, the final shape and design of the stills was still kind of in the air. I still remember James walking in to see me and uh, handed me a sheet of paper and I had about uh, 50 pictures of various shapes of stills. And he said, which two would you, which two would you pick, Graham? All oh, right. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I think, he, I think James asked many people in the, in the company that question and they tallied the, we knew what we were looking for. We knew we were looking for a, a, shape, a shape of still and production that would accentuate the heavy beated character and the taste profile we're looking for and so yeah we, we all threw our, our own ideas into that and I, I think in the end what came out was a perfect team effort at this at the site here 
Cool. I also really like the uh, design of the um, of the distillery. So can you tell us because it's completely different from Locranza, very very different, uh, you know, uh, in everything, are uh, you know, designing wise, architecture wise. So can you tell us a little bit the way it's shaped and uh, how much space you actually have? You know, we saw some footage from the video as well, but uh, just tell us a little bit about the space itself. If there are plans to maybe expand in the future as well. Well, first of all, the shape of the distillery itself, uh, anyone who's visited here will tell you right away, it's a, yeah, they're struck immediately by the actual design of it. It was uh, built and designed with the, the main focus on having as little impact to the beautiful environment as possible. It was a, it's a fantastic piece of scenery down here. I've had many people describe it as, as God's country because they think it's such a beautiful, scenic area. And we wanted to lower impact as much as we could. So we've employed what's called a sedum roof, which is a, a grass tail roof. And we've kept the distillery actually quite low. Not it's not it's not a towering uh, obelisk. It's actually quite low to the ground with sharp peaks. This and that's to accentuate the the rolling of the, the, the hills, it, so it kind of blends into the background as you're driving towards it. It's not just some big grey building, big grey cube. Actually, the, the tallest point of the of the peak. The reason it's that height is because that that allows for the the height of the stills. That's the that's the very point where the stills are. That's why we had to make it that certain height. Otherwise, we would have gone lower. And uh, to answer your other question, yes, there are. Look, we are looking to build three new warehouses on site. We currently have the three, uh, which are used for both uh, lag and Lacranza barrels. And uh, we're we're needing in about a year's time. We figure we'll be quite full up. So we're hoping to get three more uh, warehouses built on site by the yeah. end of next year. Yeah, we do. We do care a lot about um, uh, microclimate. You know, we were talking about yesterday a lot about it, especially you know up in Lacranza, but nonetheless, even down south, you know, lag, which is you know warmer and completely different. Instead of being surrounded by mountains, it's beautiful view on the sea. It's very much like you know a big valley, uh, which is you know which is gonna be interesting. You know, to it's gonna be nice to be able to say that we're maturing everything on the island which is going to be great. So I'm actually taking this a little break to answer a few of the questions. Uh, um, thank you guys again for joining us. Uh, you, we have a very nice question uh, from uh, um, Ishay that is asking, uh, how will you describe the peat influence of the lag whiskey in comparison to other peaty Highland whiskey? And uh, how low is the cut of your distillation? This was actually a question that I wanted to ask you too. Uh, can you tell us um, how would you say like spirit is really? Well, the, the actual cut of live spirit is 63% at 20 degrees. We run the four shots for rough, roughly 30 minutes. We bring it from 75% down to 74% at 20 degrees. As we bring it over to the spirit, the average spirit run at lag is about an hour and 45 minutes, slightly under, is slightly less than uh, Locranza because we do run them are still slightly faster. The actual character of the spirit, though, it's heavy, it's peated, it's very earthy, phenolic, slightly medicinal, but there are lots of other peated distilleries that bring their uh, cuts lower. We didn't want to bring our cuts too low. I actually experimented, and it was a, one, one of my favorite moments. So I was um, experimenting with the spirit when we first opened the distillery, and I started the cuts at 62.5, and I slowly ramped up. And when I got to 63 exactly, I thought, that's it. It's what I want. I don't want to go any higher. I don't want to change it. Amazing. It's also asking the peat from. Uh, the peat is supplied, but we, we don't actually malt on site. Uh, the barley, the malt, the barley is given to us pre pre peated, pre malted, and it's uh, the, the actual peat itself comes from uh, St Fergus up in the northeast of Scotland. That's where the maltsters uh, harvest their peat. So it's a it's kind of a, it's a moorland peat, but it's quite close to the coast. It's not. It can't be. It won't be described as a coastal peat, but it'll be described more as a moorland peat, maybe a slight characteristic of the, of the coast. Cool. A uh, few more things uh, is actually, first of all, we would like to say happy birthday to Tobias uh, that is saying is a nice video conference on his birthday. So great day to have a birthday. <laughs> we wish you were all, you know, we wish you were alive with us celebrating with even more whiskey, but uh, uh, just I hope you're having a lovely Sunday anyway. And then David Fowler, hi David, is actually asking, uh, you bottled, do you make uh, lag? So is there a plan to bottle two year old? Uh, we're actually going to try to get there uh, later on a one-year-old, uh, lag one-year-old uh, spirit. So um, someone is also asking when the 
whiskey officially will be out in the market? I don't know if we can answer that question yet, but I'll, I'll let you say what your opinion is. Oh, absolutely. We, we hope to release our two-year-old spirits uh, April next year. That's definitely the plan. We were originally hoping to do one this year, but with the way things happened, unfortunately, it, it kind of just uh, all fell apart. But we were in preparations and uh, a, a plan to make a very limited release, but things just didn't go that way. But we definitely are looking for a two-year-old spirit. And of course, as with every good distillery, we'll have a first three-year-old whiskey as soon as it's ready out the door. Cool. Um, so I know that since we started, since we actually opened our distillery, peat has always been our main focus and uh, we kept that, you know, love for experimenting going, you know, throughout the company, even down at LAG. So one of my questions actually would be, uh, I know that we have barley fields, which is very exciting because hopefully in the future we'll be able to have a 100%, you know, iron whiskey especially if it's, uh, you know, like peated uh, down at uh, like. But uh, is there any uh, idea, do, do you ever think about using iron peat, like from the island itself? Absolutely, we definitely get, uh, we've uh, definitely had a, a lot of thought about using local peat. It's not as easy harvesting as much peat here as, uh, as elsewhere. There's a, there's a lot more um, things to go through but it's not a it's it's not an area that's known for harvesting peat unlike the places where the actual malts men use but yes we have definitely considered hopefully in the future having 100 percent iron where we have iron peat it just be a batch iron peat iron malt even now even the uh, barley itself will have been uh, uh, fed from our own effluent because we actually spread into the fields uh, barley fields next to like the study so it'll be 100 percent uh, iron in every way possible Nice. <laughs> That'd be very cool. Um, so a few more questions. Actually, I wanted to ask as we're talking so much about spirit and the style of whiskey that we're trying to create. Um, how many casks roughly are we filling at the moment per week? And actually, what sort of casks um, are we choosing? As you said before, wood policy is a big thing for us. So what sort of casks are we choosing uh, for uh, maturing at the moment? Uh, the vast majority of our casts, about 98%, 97% is first fall bourbons, uh, straight from Kentucky. The vast majority of which right now range between ex Buffalo Trace and ex uh, Jim Beam, Beam Centauri. They are fantastic casks, absolutely beautiful. You can smell them. <laughs> when, when I, I always make a wee uh, gesture to have a wee smell of the barrels when they first come in. The, 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 scent, the scent of bourbon and vanilla is oh, it's wonderful. But uh, the, the rest, the rest that we do do. Actually, we, we just got a batch of uh, X wine casks in uh, last week. Uh, some Saturn and Amarone just came straight in, and I'll be filling them over the next couple of weeks, and will be something to look forward to. Yeah, in I, many I, I, am I am so looking forward to that. You have no idea. <laughs> Peter, Peter, uh, Peter, lagging Amarone casks and literally right up my way. So. So much looking forward to that. Thank you for telling me that. I didn't have a clue. So that's very exciting. And actually, as I said before as well, very exciting times. We just uh, filled um, a few bourbon barrels, uh, sherry hulks and sherry bats with lag spirit and locranta spirit. So that's going to be, you know, an interesting uh, blended malt to try in the future too. So I'm glad that now we have two distilleries to play around with and two completely different styles of spirit to play around with too. Um, uh, a question for you actually is because we've only been running the distillery for a year, a little over a year, and uh, I, I didn't want to ask you a lot of details why we were, you know, trying to make whiskey and spirit for the first time because I know it can be very, you know, there are lots of issues to solve very fast. But did you have, what was like the most maybe problematic moment that you had, you know, or maybe also, you know, the what was the hardest part of actually trying to build the distillery and try to make it run properly to create spirit? Well, right off the bat, the um, I do remember the hardest part when we were first constructing the distillery was just the the um, the fact that we lived on an island and the winters were often quite hard. I mean, it was no one's no one's real fault, but uh, sometimes um, ferries couldn't run for obvious reasons and that held back production, held back uh, construction. We actually started quite a few months later last year it, producing than we originally had planned. So we were off to we were off to quite a, a, quite, a, quite, a quite a delayed lead to begin with, but we did fantastic. We managed to catch up eventually, which 
was great help to all the staff here. It was fantastic of them to just burn through everything and manage to get everything going. Um, I think uh, in production, the biggest uh, hurdle we had, I think, was originally the water, but uh, it was fixed. Uh, the water was quite hard. We didn't realize how hard it was. It was uh, not. It was completely safe. Everything was fine about it, but it was just causing a bit of scale issues with like, the cooling tower and some of the tanks and pipes. But we fixed that relatively quickly. As soon as we realized that was an issue, we wanted to nip it in the bud just to prevent any kind of future breakdowns, any kind of choking that can happen in the heat exchangers. We've got our reverse osmosis unit now on site and that purifies the water completely, which I think actually gives us um, some of the purest, some of the purer water that most distilleries can get up. I've been, I've been told by our maltsters that, uh, we sh that most distilleries should be quite envious of us now. <laughs> <laughs> so at least now it's not just... Uh... Not just Locranza, you know, shutting around the pure water. Now you can do that too down at Lag, <laughs> which is cool. So one last question I have for you actually is, I remember talking about the same subject um, with uh, the same topic with uh, Katie, our uh, senior to guide at Locranza, about the fact that, uh, you know, excuse the ignorance, but I've, I've only learned about Aaron, you know, a year and a half ago, and I'm slowly learning more and more as I go, as I go on. But uh, one of the things that stru struck me quite a lot when we opened our second distillery was how happy were the people on Ireland, especially people that were living on the southern side, because um, the southern side is not as busy, you know, as touristy as the northern side. So do you think that actually building a distillery down at Lag was very beneficial also for the community? Yes, absolutely. There's... There, there is plenty. There is lots of lovely scenic routes and sites down in the south end of the island. There just there was a lot of um, lay by destinations. Plenty of lovely hotels and restaurants where people can have their lunch. But oftentimes there wasn't a direct destination. It was just maybe we'll, we'll drive down the south end and we'll come up the other end. But having the distillery down here means we'll go to the distillery and we'll get we'll definitely see the what's what's ha what what the sights and sounds are down there. And I, I, from what I gather, all the local businesses have been very happy with the distillery down here because it definitely brings. It brings the traffic down because a lot of trippers to Arran, they'll either want to go north to Lagranza or a lot of them want to stay towards the central belt area because maybe they don't want to take a bus. But this gives them a reason maybe to take the bus and venture further out from the wee safety net of just Brodick, Lamlash and Waiting Bay. Absolutely. Exciting. We actually have a question from Jack. Hi, Jack. Uh, he's uh, asking that we, uh, we talked about this previously, uh, about the fact that actually Lagranza is a... Um, is a highland distillery and lag is a lowland distillery. So is it actually just down to a line that was designed on a map and iron was divided in two? I've actually got a story about this because I, I learned a lot setting up this distillery because I had to apply with HMRC, Customs and Excise. I had to do all the paperwork with them. And I was actually quite surprised that they sent me a big form, big large documentation, phone book, you know, the usual. And when I went through everything, it asked me about um, to what region, how to clarify, how to classify the distillery. So I thought, okay, well, it's an island distillery, straight up, no, no issue there. I went through the, the process and then I realised HMRC doesn't actually have a they don't see Ireland as a as a region they don't actually view Ireland as a region which completely took me by surprise I had no idea that was a thing I, I always thought Ireland you know Sky Orkney everything but apparently they count as Highlands and they just so happen to be above the Highland Fall and so okay well, well what can we do well we're not Campbelltown we're not Speyside we're not Isla so yeah. Yeah. we're either Highland or Lowland and so I just naturally took well we technically are in the lowland because we're below the, the fault line so i thought i'll be a bit brave here and just why don't i make us the because they're not, not they're, i'm following the rules here why don't, I, why don't i make us the only only lowland island distillery in all of scotland and so i put that down and they accepted it and they were very no one seems to be no, no problems came back so that's us we're officially a lowland distillery <laughs> it's a nice story to tell at the end of the day i always think it just it's just pushing us to um to build the third distillery so that we can finally call Aaron a region and then, you know, problem solved. So guys, if any of you wants to open a distillery, just get in touch and we'll get it sorted uh, in the few years so, <laughs> so that we can finally do it. Cool, I think it's time to actually have a little uh, taste of something nice. So I know that you have a, a one-year-old spirit with you over there. Uh, you got a sample from a cask. I put myself a little bit of Lagnumake, which I absolutely adore. 
which is over here. So I'm just going to be tasting with you a bit of spirit. Obviously, I have, you know, zero age, you know, in a cask. So it would be interesting to see the difference. So tell us a little bit about this, what you're drinking now. Well, what I'm drinking here is uh, from one of the first ever cask islands we did. It was actually cask number 18, uh, which I pulled out of the warehouse. Uh, there was no particular reason why. It was um, just one of the. It was one of the of the first ones we filled. It was the first one I saw, and I thought, yeah, I'll give that a try. And it was a damn good choice, actually. <laughs> right. Well, I'm sure a lot of you have tried the new make experiment. If you haven't, please do. It's a phenomenal new make. It's uh, I was. I don't want to say I was ple pleasantly surprised. I want to say, oh, it was the plan all along. But I was really surprised at how well it turned out and how palatable <laughs> it was. <laughs> I was very, very grateful. I was very, very happy. Right, so as, as you probably know, it's um, it's surprisingly smooth, yet a bit fiery, very fiery. But the, the peatiness kind of takes the edge off. It makes it a very, very pleasant drink. I'm sure Mariella would uh, agree with me there. But uh, what I can say about the one-year-old is that uh, only in just one year, and I don't know if you can really see the colour. That's only just one year of maturation in our Buffalo Trace cask. You're already mm -hmm. getting the lovely sweetness coming off that cask. You can actually get hints of the bourbon. Hints of a little bit of just a little bit of vanilla and toffee, just a little, little bit there. There's plenty of smoke and fire still there. But what really caught me off guard was no, no rich, nothing, no fire. Absolutely, I'm so surprised how much it's been able to mellow in just one year's time. And I, I've tasted one-year-old spirit before at Lochranza multiple times, and. So as far as I'm concerned, it's probably the best one-year-old spirit I think I've ever tried. Um, it's surprising. It's, it's the sweetness, the, the the peat and the the lovely casks that we have. I've just combined so perfectly. You get a, although it's probably too early to start talking about tasting notes, but I've already gotten burnt toffee and licorice, just a little bits of it. And I know it's... <laughs> I mean... I'm not going to myself too much here. <laughs> I mean... Uh, we know we know you are uh, we know your uh, you know we know your bias but at the same time you know i have exactly the same experience when i pour like new make i normally have it with me as a side thing you know when i do my tastings and then a little treat for everyone i just put them a bit of like new make don't tell them you know much about it i'm just like this is our spirit and nine times out of ten people just go like how to drink this like i could just you know it's just tasty it's just so tasty and i love using that in everything. I love to make uh, cocktails out of it. I was telling yesterday as well, and I feel quite naughty, I love to drop, uh, I love to drop a little bit of this in a whiskey, you know, in an iron, Lacranza whiskey, you know, in an iron uh, mold, just to give it a little bit of a kick, you know, a little bit of a smoky kick to it, which is awesome. Uh, this on the cream liqueur and the iron gold is absolutely stunning. I make brownies with this. I make everything. It's just absolutely delicious. If you're into very complex but also quite you know versatile easy you know smooth that like, lovely iron style you know iron texture that just goes down so smoothly even at 63.5 which is dangerous this is just right up your way so i'm so excited to see a three-year-old because i think it's still you know with our differences in distillation we're still making sure that there is that you know um heathery earthy you know smokiness coming through but uh, it's not too, you know, it's not like the most overpowering thing. There's just so much more. I call it the mezcal because it literally tastes like a very, very good, uh, you know, very, very good mezcal, which is complex, it's sweet, it's spicy, it's smoky. It's got everything you want in a, in a glass, which is awesome. So well done to you, Graham. <laughs> well, <laughs> take, take the credit. <laughs> cool. Um, amazing. Oh, there we go. Nice, I'm gonna have actually a sip because I didn't sip this yet. I'm so used to drinking this. So cheers. To all the people at home, I hope you're drinking this as well. So cheers. Amazing. I'm so looking, I'm so jealous that you're drinking them one year old and I don't have it with me, but uh, you need to save some for when I come visit as well. Cool. Um, in terms of actual whiskey, uh, I know that I like, you know, we need to wait a few years, but uh, do you have any specific, um, uh, do you have any specific like whiskey that we have at our like distillery that you like the most? I'm a, quite a big fan of the, the Finkel's Cut range. I was uh, 
genuinely surprised that how lovely it was. It was it's a beautiful, beautiful whiskey, particularly the um, sherry. I love the quarter cask. I adore the rum cask, but my heart's my heart's for sherry. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a, I just like the rich texture. I've always loved my sherry cask finishes with whiskey, and um, I've actually I was actually poured myself one as well, just in case. Oh, just, oh, the color alone blows my mind. Of the of the thing was cut sherry. It's um by far my favourite of the whiskey we sell down here, and it was um one of it's it's it, I know it's a it's a beautiful Elavan or Granza Granza whiskey. Uh, I had a small part in potentially making it. I think I don't know how much of it I made, but I do remember we um it was always, always every October in Granza when we did the Peter run before uh, we stopped doing that in the last year or so. And these are these are the result of that from seven, eight, nine so years ago, and it's a, it's a lovely, lovely dram. So rich, so so smooth, and so tasty. It's just it's got all, it's got all the notes I love. Absolutely, especially uh, considering the ABV as well. It's uh, it's stunning. I get drink so. Uh, this is a uh, uh, when I think of lag, I actually think of this style. I don't know why. It just this style of maybe the color just reminds me of like you know fire. Like you know, reminds me of peatiness more. Uh, but uh, it, it just, uh, do you think there'd be any resemblance? I know this is like a long shot because obviously we, you know, we can't predict the future. But do you think th there'll be any resemblance from, you know, this style of whiskey, which is Locranza Malt, 50 ppm, and maybe a future lag finished in a sherry cask? Well, we're, we're, we're definitely going to try and aim for something similar because I know it's a very, very popular whiskey. I mean, just the number of people that are buying it alone uh, tells me that it's a very popular whiskey. But it, it will never be exactly the same. No distillery can produce the exact same whiskey, no matter how hard you try. And we do want to try and have, have like cut its own destiny, its own flavour profile. We, we don't want to just do everything our, our big sister does. I mean, that's it's not going to work that way if we do so. But I, from, from the way things are going at, at uh, Lag, we're definitely going to have a, a, a heavily peated malt. It's going to be—it's not going to be as sweet as Locranza. That is one thing I can't—I can't say. But there is going to be probably a lot more complex flavours. We're going to have a, a lot more of the, the earthy conjurers that are going to come through in spirit. Probably give a bit more of the deep root complexity rather than just the, the estuary sweetness. Absolutely. <laughs> very much looking forward to trying it in the future. We actually have another question from uh, David Fowler, which is very interesting. He's asking. Do you already notice the difference in character between two bourbon casks, you know, side by side that have been maturing for a year only? Uh, no, not not entirely. There are there. I don't know. I think it's the microclimate. The bourbon casks are actually retaining a lot of the same flavour themselves. The ones that have been cast in the same year, uh, on average, they have all lost about just 0.5 percent ABV. So. Of all the bourbon casks I've been testing, I tested quite a few uh, a few months ago in preparation for the one-year-old. As I said, I wasn't able to we weren't able to go ahead with, and I was getting striking resemblances, sixty-three percent everywhere, um, same lovely deep colour and sweetness. Uh, and let, I think if I, if I, I think if I went for a second fill cask, we did we did a couple of second fill casks as well as first fill casks uh, rather early on. I think if I picked one of them, it'd be a big difference. But I think just the quality of the casks we got mixed in with our spirit has just given us this lovely universal flavour here. Absolutely. <laughs> Amazing. So I don't have um, many more questions for you, but I want to give uh, the people that are following us uh, today, that are watching this, uh, a little bit more time to actually, you know, gather their thoughts if you have any more questions. But in the meanwhile, I just want to remind you uh, that actually the like uh, spirit, um, this little new make here at 63.5%, and the Fingles cut, uh, the bourbon and the sherry cask are actually available to buy from our web shop as well. So normally there will be like distillery exclusive that so many people cry and and asking me to send them a bottle uh, because they, you know, the only way to get it was to get, you know, to actually come to lag. Uh, but, you know, you're lucky that, you know, this virus happened. So now you can actually purchase them online, which is much easier. So if you're interested to try a 50 BBM Locranza whiskey, uh, especially made for lag distillery, you can still buy it over there. Also, for all the people that are interested in maybe uh, joining our lag cask society membership, uh, it is a great opportunity to become a cask corner. There are lots of benefits. Uh, you get first, I think the biggest one, the one that everyone talks about is the fact that you're actually going to get a bottle 
uh, from uh, cask number one, which is the one that Graham mentioned before. And there are a lot of other benefits. So if you're interested in becoming a cask owner today, uh, send us an email anytime and we're more than happy to share with you all, uh, all the details that you need to know uh, before becoming a La Cask member, which is pretty nice. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, I don't have any more questions, but Graham, would you like to say something uh, to our followers today? Oh, um, well, thank, I, I want to thank you for putting up my spiel for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I think I always talk a, a little waffle. I never know what, I never know, I never plan these things. I never know what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do, but I just hope it was enjoyable. And I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to come here and to join us in what would have been festivities for our first, for our one year anniversary, essentially. And it's a shame you, it's a shame you couldn't be here, but I do hope at home that you can at least join me. Nariz, to like the and I look forward to seeing you next time. Hopefully forward. you'll be here soon. Bye. Cool. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> One last thing I forgot to say actually is uh, there'll be actually a little toast with, with Graham, uh, Graham, with Graham as well. Sorry, uh, <laughs> my Italian accent comes through weird at sometimes. But there'll be a little uh, greeting videos uh, from our like uh, team and uh, I love Iron team as well at 5 p.m. being posted on our pages today, and then there'll be our toast tomorrow from our Locrata Distillery celebrating the 25th anniversary. So. Uh, you know, it's an excuse for you to grab another drum and just join us for a toast. So I just join you, Graham, as well. Cheers. And uh, we hope to welcome you all to lag very, very soon. Cheers. Thank you.